Good morning, First Peter. First Peter, written obviously by the Apostle Peter, to a dispersed group of Christians. So in some way, this letter must have been encyclical. So to be passed around the churches. And the church at this point is enduring some kind of persecution. Um, so not the full-blown persecutions that we see later in the second century, obviously, but there is some kind of persecution for their faith here because he is immediately, he says to them as he's opening his letter, um, that they are not to think that the fiery trial that they're enduring is something strange, but that God is using it to mature their faith. Um, the theme of the letter, because there is this, this opposition that Peter sets up between those who are Christians, who have inherited all of the promises of the Old Testament covenants. So when he says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a special people to God, he's actually quoting the promises of the Mosaic covenant that were made to the children of Israel. Peter transfers those promises onto us as Christians. We are now that royal priesthood, that special people of God, and we are separated from the world. And then there is this other group of people, those who do not believe, the unbelievers, those who are, um, who are persecuting the church, uh, those who live in floods of dissipation and sinful lives that he's talking about. And a number of times as you read the letter, you're going to notice that Peter talks about the impact of our holy lives on the unbelievers around us. So he says, live such good lives among the Gentiles that when they see your good works, even when they speak evil of you, when they see how, how, how cleanly and how ethically you live, that they will be ashamed, that they will glorify God in the day of visitation. When he visits them, part of the witness that would have counted is the, the witness of your life. You know, probably the best form of evangelism for most Christians who don't have the gift of the evangelist and honestly speaking, let's be honest with each other. We don't get into gospel conversations on most days of our lives with people. But the one thing that is constantly preaching and the one thing that that unbelievers, those around you who you work with or family members are watching is the way you live your life. The righteousness with which you live, the self-control the freedom from the love of money, your clean language, you're not participating in drunken parties. You're, the cleanness of your life is a witness to people, an effective witness. This is one of the main themes of, of the, letter to, um, the letter of Peter. Um, what I want to pick up on, though, is something which you, you could overlook. So there's this, there's this division, this dichotomy between the godly and the ungodly. And yet there is this influence that the godly can have on the ungodly through their righteous living. And, and then we get to the point that I want to make, which is that we are not called to do this alone. Because you can read the book of 1 Peter and it can be quite overwhelming. All of these ethical instructions and commands that we are being given by the apostle. That we ought to live such clean lives, we are to give up. You know, all, all of the evil that we used to, to do and, and all of this. And it can kind of feel like, man, I'm, I've got to soldier on in this Christian life. You know, and even if I'm persecuted, I've got to soldier on. Yes, that's true. But you don't soldier on alone. And being in community as a Christian is one of the great keys to being able to live a holy life. So I want to read a few of those verses to you. Uh, first, chapter 1, verse 22 since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Okay, so there we see the initial notes of what, whatever we're called to do as Christians, and however hard it is to live this clean and ethical life, that is a witness to the world. We do it while being loved fervently by an inner circle. You know, if you've ever been dissatisfied or caused 
had cause to kind of envy. Maybe it happens to you if you watch a movie and you see famous people or you, you watch a documentary or you, you, you read some trashy magazine that shows pictures of famous people or whatever and your flesh has been tempted to kind of want the, the life and the glamour that they have. You know one of the, the, the biggest antidotes to that and sorry, not just the desire for what they have but the feeling of insignificance that it gives you that it can kind of make, it, it belittles you. It belittles your worth, your value, that you're not a celebrity. You know, one of the biggest antidotes to that feeling of worthlessness is to get back together with your friends. Because your friends love you. And when your friends treat you with respect and love and laughter, and all of a sudden you're not worried about the celebrities and all that. So community, very powerful thing. Love one another fervently. Then um, in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, this is where he quotes the Mosaic covenant promises. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So he's just been contrasting those who believe in Jesus and are saved with those who reject Jesus and stumble at the stumbling block, the rock of offense. So again, he's, he's contrasting two peoples. And then he, he, he says to them, you are the people of God. Now we can miss that. Yes, that's wonderful for me. It gives me dignity. Wonderful, yes, but I'm not alone in it. I, we once were not a people, but now we are a people. You, my friend, if you're a Christian, you're one of my people. I am a people with you and you are a people with me. We're in this together. And so we must encourage one another. I'm getting to a point which I haven't got to yet, okay? I'm going to read you a verse later, which is going to bring all of this together. But I'm just setting the scene. Okay, then uh, verse eight, uh, 8 of chapter 3. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Sure, I mean, you could spend hours preaching through that little verse. And each of the words that he uses there to describe our relationships with one another. I'm going to leave it for you to read through that again. It's very powerful. The love of this people as we dwell together. Then um, chapter 4 verses 3 and 4. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Okay, now there's a, there's a little note that gets played in that couple of verses that I'm going to pick up on. Again, he's contrasting these two peoples, those who do not serve God and live in sin, and those of us who do not live in sin anymore. But I want to read you how he describes it. He says, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in this flood of dissipation. You know, one of the words used to describe a sinful life is a fleshly life or a carnal life. The point that I'm wanting to get to is that when you sin, you sin in the body. Now, yes, it, it comes from the heart, but we have been designed, created to express our beings physically. And that's why you're going to get a resurrection body and you're going to live in a body for all eternity because God wants you to live in a body. It's part of who you are. It's not like your body is just some arbitrary thing and your spirit or soul is the real you. You've heard that said before. Well, that's not biblical. Your body is the real you. And God wants you to have a body. It's part of who you are. 
And because we live in, in a physical world, the way you participate with either of these camps is going to be physical. There's a physical expression to it. And so he says, they think it's strange that you don't run with them. You've got to physically go be with people in order to partake of their drinking parties and their revelries, etc. Then he says uh, in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 4, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Have fervent love for one another. Now he speaks again of this community. Now, how does all this happen? How is it that you can receive strength and encouragement for a holy life that will impact the unbelievers around you? By being in a community that loves you fervently. Okay, how does it happen? Verse 9, chapter 4. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Okay. Be hospitable to one another. The thought at the end of this <laughs> devotion is actually pretty simple. It is this. How often do you open your home to other Christians? You know that opening your home, being hospitable to one another, unlocks so much of what God wants us to do and be for each other. Because we have to physically be together to love one another fervently, to pray for one another, to exhort and encourage one another, and to, 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 to just be a, a, um, an influence on one another. So much of, of what happens in life and what moves us and changes us Happens physically with people we're with physically. And so, yes, we are part of a people that's opposed to the people who don't believe in God. Yes, God wants to, us to live a pure and holy life and influence the unbelievers around us. These are the themes of Peter. And part of, of what unlocks that is the love of Christians expressed to one another, unlocked by gathering together. So, my friend... I can say my wife and I, throughout our lives as Christians, we've been Christians now for 25 years. For most of that 25 years, we have had a home group of sorts in our home. On a weekly basis, we're having people in our home. And we have just made that decision. We're going to be hospitable. We're going to open our home. And so many relationships have been built in our home. So many prayers have been prayed in our home. So many words of encouragement have been built in our home. So many people's lives have been impacted by my wife and I simply by opening our home and then doing what Christians do together. So, what can you do to be more hospitable to your fellow Christians? God bless you. See you tomorrow.